everyone. It is time for one more lecture. And we were talking about how we might criticize systems of ideas and how we can explain thinking, ideology, especially false ideas without resorting to attributing them to evil, stupidity, you know, malice, whatever. In other words, by not making it about the presumed deficiencies of the thinker, especially not if we're looking at ways of thinking that are widely shared in society. So um, we want to arrive at some way of analyzing ideas that allows us to say, this is why they exist in this shape. This is what's going on in the world that leads to this, as it were, sick and twisted refraction in the mind of a large number of people. Necessarily, it cannot be, can be, there can be variations, but there is a logical necessity that if you live in a world that is made up like this, you're going to think some variation on that theme. So, and I said that um, before we fully get to how Marx conceives of this relation between world and ideas, um, we talked about Hegel first, who thinks that essentially you can say those types of ideas that don't make sense are ideas that lack substance. And that's that. They have no actuality. They're merely accidental. And I talked about Feuerbach, who is looking specifically as, at Christianity in order to get to a conclusion about human nature versus, you know, which is reflected in the true faith versus the false reality in a society where people aren't free and equal, which is reflected in the theology, which is a lie, which doesn't match with the true religion. So, and then the next step, and I want to do that part a little more extensively, because it leads us away from Hegel and towards Marx's method, are the theses on Feuerbach, where Marx criticizes Feuerbach's essence of Christianity. And then next, um, I want to discuss on the Jewish question. Oh. Because Marx here further expands on that theme, but also because that text on the Jewish question has long served conservative critics of Marx um, as a basis for declaring Marx an anti-Semite and making the claim that Marxism is inherently an anti-Semitic project, or more, that the only, the only main point of Marxism is to make the world free from Jews. In the world, in the words of um, an author who I only just discovered, who wrote one of these treatises against Marx's Jewish question on that false basis in 1959. I knew that there was a recent author who was, who was a best-selling author. Um, I think the title of the book is American Marxism. And there is a big um, chunk of the argument that builds on this misinterpretation, willful, I should say, of the Jewish question. So this is an important text to discuss in detail if you're dealing with Marx and especially sort of, you know, grounds for dismissing Marx sight unseen. And this will be, you know, pe people from the right will bring this up and say, look, you don't have to deal with this guy. He's an anti-Semite. There's nothing salvageable. Um, but before we can do that, let's first get through the uh, theses on Feuerbach. I'm going to read a few of them. Um, remember, Feuerbach was aiming to show that the true nature of humanity, human essence, is reflected in Christian religion. Um, and the point of, 
of people becoming truly free would be to recognize that really we need Christianity merely as this mirror to hold up, um, to show us our true nature. But if we could just live lives like the free, equal individuals that we are, who can rationally determine our, uh, uh, our fate and be moral in the process, then we really would make Christianity unnecessary. So the second thesis on Feuerbach is, quote, the question whether objective truth can be attributed to human thinking is not a question of theory, but is a practical question. Man must prove the truth, that is to say the reality and power, this, the this-sidedness of his thinking in practice. The dispute over the reality or non-reality of thinking that is isolated from the practice is a purely scholastic question. So this also goes back to the whole discussion on epistemology that we had earlier on in this class. Marx is saying it's a, it's a scholastic question. If you're only talking about epistemology, if the thinking is without contradiction, if you're not um, looking at how it relates to the practice, not just the real world, but the practice, um, then you're doing it wrong. Feuerbach is saying, let's be materialist. Let's show what in the real world is producing these thoughts and how these thoughts then also prevent us from changing the real world in ways that would make sense. For this, in the third thesis, Marx says, the materialist doctrine concerning the changing of circumstances and upbringing forgets that circumstances are changed by men and that it is essential to educate the educator himself. This doctrine must therefore divide society into two parts, one of which is superior to society. The coincidence of the changing of circumstances and of human activity or self-changing can be conceived and rationally understood only as revolutionary practice. Not as a program, but rather he is saying what has been going on, human history, how the world has been changing. That change is revolutionary practice. And we've been doing that, even though we may not have been thinking about it right or haven't understood it right, but that doesn't matter. Um, so what's this critique here of materialism? The critique is of a simple materialism that says man is fully determined by circumstances and upbringing. Whether it's nature or nurture, both are determinants. So, but who nurtures you? And um, what is natural about the world? And what is man-made? And how much do we change them? So in the end, um, the formulation is people don't make history under conditions. And history, people make history, make their own history, but they don't make it under conditions of their own choosing. But of course, then they reshape the conditions which will shape future and even the present generation. So this activity is always mediating, constantly mediating between the given reality and the thoughts of people. And uh, it goes back and forth and one shapes the other. It's not a one way The fourth thesis is Feuerbach starts out from the fact of religious self-alienation, of the duplication of the world into a religious world and a secular. In other words, you know, the, the, um, uh, the veil of tears of, of this world and then sort of, you know, the, the, the blessed heavens. Feuerbach's work consists in resolving the religious world into its secular basis, meaning uh, he shows how, what kind of reality, what higher truth is reflected in the faith, but that the secular basis detaches itself from itself and establishes itself as an independent realm in the clouds can only be explained by the cleavages and self-contradiction within the secular basis. In other words, if nothing had been wrong with the secular world, why would it have to 
acquire this split consciousness in the first place. The latter, which is to say the secular basis, therefore, must in itself be both understood in its contradiction and revolutionized in practice. So it's not enough to understand that the real world um, is put together wrong and that the religious world shows us what the real world could be like. But it's also about understanding why the split occurred in the first place and what to do about it. So, and what to change about it. Any questions up to this point before I continue? Yes. These are Marxist critiques of Freiburg. These are Marxist critiques of Feuerbach. Marxist thesis on Marxist thesis on Feuerbach. So the next one goes uh, to the question of human essence. In other words, what is the concept of humanity? What is the true nature of humanity? Um, where we can assume that maybe, you know, if humans live wrong, that's a mere appearance, but what's the true essence behind it? So see, thesis number six goes, Feuerbach resolves the religious essence into the human essence. But the human essence is no abstraction inherent in each single individual. Feuerbach does not, oh, sorry, in its reality, it's the ensemble of the social relations. And we might add to that which change over time are being changed by people over time in the historical process. So in other words, um, this ends the concern with the question, what is human nature? What is humanity truly, really deep down? There is nothing deep down. It is the ensemble of social relations. You are what you eat, but you also make your own dishes, so to speak. Um, Feuerbach, who does not enter upon a criticism of this real essence, is consequently compelled, first, to abstract from the historical process and to fix the religious sentiment as something by itself and to presuppose an abstract, isolated human individual. The individual isolated and connected with the rest of humanity by simply sharing this abstract essence. Second, essence, therefore, can be comprehended only as genus, as an internal dumb generality, which naturally unites the many individuals. And the um, and Marx's idea is that's not how it is. We become the species we are through the interactions that we have with each other and the institutions we build and the social practice that we um, you know, participate. And if you want to know what humans are truly, then you know at any given point in time, look at how they live, um, and then you know. And the other thing is that Feuerbach looks for some unchangeable human nature. And the changeability is what really defines human nature. Oh. That's the one thing that's the constant if you're looking for. The ability to change itself and the ability to change the world. That is what defines humanity. Um, in thesis number seven, Marx says, quote, Feuerbach consequently does not see that the religious sentiment is itself a social product and that the abstract individual whom he analyzes belongs to a particular form of society. What that means is um, that, you know, the way people believe, the way the faith looks um, in the heart of the believers has actually got a history that has changed over time. Um, if you've studied medieval history, has anybody here like looked at the history of Christianity and the, and the way, so like the baby Jesus, for instance, you know, the worship of a frail, cute, cuddly, very human savior is it entirely a, a thing that becomes uh, thinkable in the Middle Ages? No, no sign of that for the first thousand years. It is Jesus, the conquering, uh, 
avenger or Jesus, the Roman lawyer who sits at the court where God will hear the final pleas of the uh, defendant. But um, baby Jesus, definitely. So this probably just the sound of people sawing things in half in a laboratory. This is, after all, the engineering building. Human practice. <laughs> um, all social life is essentially practical. All mysteries, like where that sound came from, which lead theory to mysticism, find their rational solution in human practice and in the comprehension of this practice. See what I mean? Um, so, what that means is stop with the philosophy, study sociology. And now they could stop because it's getting on my nerves. <laughs> um, and I'm probably seeing it. If YouTube has AI that can filter this out, but I doubt it. Um, anyway, so yeah, that means that really if you're interested in what humanity is and can be and, and should be and how, how you want to change it, you want to study society. You really want like a science of society, sociology. Um, but beyond that, like where does it come from? Where does this old materialist way of thinking come from? And, and here we are entering the territory of the terminology that we'll revisit in the Jewish question. Thesis number nine, the highest point reached by contemplative materialism, which is to say materialism, which does not comprehend sensuousness as practical activity, the contemplation of single individuals and of civil society. So in other words, this is the kind of materialism that does not understand that the sense perception that we have, by which we gain scientific data, is also a form of praxis. Um, it sees this part of receiving the data as a passive thing. Um, and that is how we know what the matter is, like the material we receive through sense perception. Um, but that is more than simply a reflection. There is like a process of thinking about it. There's the labor of acquiring the data. Um, and all of that is actual practical work. Um, it's not just a mental process. So if you don't place the individual person and their perception into that broader context of social activity, you're going to miss out on anything that makes somebody more than a single individual, an isolated, self-interested individual who's out for their own good. Because that's what he means when he says a single individual in civil society. So this is a term to remember when we talk about uh, the Jewish question. Civil society is, you might, you might think that because it's about, you know, civic, that it, it is about the political life, it isn't. Civil society means bourgeois society. Bourgeois understood as the economically self-interested individual, the real person who has um, a job, a house, a family, faith, a favorite TV show, um, favorite food, and so forth. So the actual living, breathing individual with business interests and opinions and so forth. So, yeah. So would civil society be like individuality? Um, in civil society, the mode in which people exist is as individuals. After the liberal ideal that society is a club that you can join and leave. Or rather that, so, well, that's, yeah, it ultimately so even society. And then the state is formed as a way to maintain order and stability. But the point is, civil society is where we are self-interested individuals, where we exist as economic actors. Yeah. So is everyone in civil society or are some people excluded? Everybody is in civil society. Um, that's one mode of existence for us. And then we might also be um, existing on a different plane. So if we're all self-interested and different, 
in our concrete real life existence, we may also consider ourselves unified on an equal plane by our faith or by our citizenship or by our humanity or whatever else. But these look like fairly abstract notions and you'd want to know how much of that is real. Um, on the other hand, the whole point of departure of Hegel and which also definitely influences Feuerbach and Marx as the big ideal, the true state of things is when humanity is not separated into competing individuals, into particularities, but when the universality um, of our species can um, exist free from contradiction like the pursuit of self-interest and so forth. So you want to get to that point where people are free, equal, self-determined, communal, and so forth, all at once. And civil society isn't that place. So to the extent that people exist in the real world, um, they don't exist in any real or actual way in the Hegelian sense, um, because they don't live up to their full potential of liberated, of emancipated humans. They merely exist, um, but it doesn't have sort of this, this you know, the subsist subsistence in the potential of the species. And this explains thesis number 10, quote, the standpoint of the old materialism is civil society. The standpoint of the new materialism that Marx wants to practice is human society or social humanity. So this would mean to perceive of humanity as one cooperative enterprise, not um, defined by competition and self-interest, but by the practice of cooperation and mutual um, you know, support and so forth. So that would be the, the real free humans could live in that kind of society. And if, if you build your materialism on that basis, you are probably going to get it right. It doesn't really matter though, to get it right. See thesis 11, the final one, which is the famous one. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it, end quote. So um, none of this is a philosophical question. You can philosophize about it all you want. Um, and it doesn't matter because we really need to go out and do something. At that point, it becomes um, practical. Questions about this so far? I guess like main critique of Feuerbach that he's like too idealistic. And he is, well, philosophically speaking, Feuerbach is a materialist because he wants to bring the Christian way of thinking down to earth and explain what in the world is the foundation for it. But the kind of what is material practice in Feuerbach's view? Uh, Marx says that's basically just the reasoning of um, that self interest individual in, in civil society. It's like the, the bourgeois philosopher um, was making up his mind about things. So it is materialism, but it's a pretty, pretty uh, limited scope of materialism because it excludes so much of material practice which is just the nitty-gritty of daily economic life. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding what Marx, Marx is claiming. He's claiming that we need to, uh, as a society, we need to move away from the civil society and move more towards the like, being unified by abstract ideas. I can't remember what. He said, he, so Feuerbach says there is this split between the ideal state of the faith in God and the messed up state of things where everything is contradictory and, and 
lacking in the real world. The point would be to bring these two together so that to resolve this contradiction. At which point, I suppose Hegelian would say both sides are subsumed and then processed to become something else. So it would be neither nor. The difference, however, is that for Marx, it is that um, in the end, it's civil society with its selfish, selfishness that exists in relation to the shiny ideal world of the state where everybody is equal as citizens. Mm -hmm. At least if you look at the most advanced modern state, and he uses like the constitutions of Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, I want to say as examples of that. Um, you want you want to also make sure to resolve that contradiction, because on the one hand, as citizens, we're self selfless, disinterested. You know, we're about the common good, and yet the moment we think about what's for dinner, we start being the 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 bourgeois. So Marx is saying we need to overcome this contradiction by um, by synthesis by um but but that again subsumption I think I mean I think that makes sense in a way like usual in this process that will do justice to both ends which like what is legitimate about both these ends needs to be found again in the end visual. Other questions about Feuerbach or the terminology? When it comes to the political side of things, there are always these practical questions. And often, more often than not, it's about groups that don't fit in and that want to do things differently and that has been historically excluded, where all the fine ideals are put to the test. And that become like the flashpoints um, for figuring out exactly what you mean by freedom, emancipation, equality, and so on. So in the 1840s, in Germany, this is a question of Jews and their status in society. In practical terms, what does that mean? If you're not fully recognized as a legitimate citizen, that might mean that you can't join um, the civil service. You can't be a teacher at the university or in a school, um, at least not if it's government run. You can't hold office. Um, you may not be able to buy land in certain places. You may not be able to join a craft and therefore you cannot start a business in a, in a craft. So there are all kinds of things where citizenship, belonging to the state, confers opportunities. And if Jews are defined as non-citizens, the state is defined as a Christian state, which it had been in Prussia always, um, but reaffirmed in the early 1840s by the new uh, ruler, William IV, um, Jews will, of course, hear that and say, what about the things we built? What about the businesses we have? What about the, you know, our, our, our rights here? So that is the, the point at this moment in the 1840s, where various people um, chime in. Feuerbach is one, Uno Bauer is another. And Bauer is the one who Marx takes issue with in the Jewish question. So the text is, in fact, Marx's text is uh, on Uno Bauer's, on the Jewish question. And so Bauer says, you Jews want rights. That's great. Look at us Germans in Prussia. Do we have any rights? We don't have representation. We don't have equality. We don't have any of the freedoms that um, would make this state substantial. It is a Christian state, and as such, it is a semblance of a state, because a real state, a true state that would live up to that name, would recognize people as free and equal individuals with all those rights listed, for instance, in the Bill of Rights or in the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, like religious liberty, freedom of speech, um, property rights, 
uh, any number of those. So Bauer says, what's the point of Jews petitioning the king to have these rights uh, that they're being denied as Jews and asking that they are given these rights as Jews. If they want rights, they should join with us, the Germans, who want to be citizens of a free state, not of a monarchy that is Christian. But just as we want to ditch the Christianity from our government as a precondition for participating, so the Jews should do the same for their Judaism in order to join our movement. So rather than asking the Christian state to recognize the, the difference, to recognize the right to withdraw from the common good and give Jews that privilege of doing their own thing, living by a separate set of laws, we should um, overturn the government together and emancipate ourselves, all of us, from religion. And then the state could become free and all of us could be recognized as individuals without the distinction of religion. Because what is religion really but a reflection of a defect in society where we are pitted against each other as competitors, as people who are withdrawn into our uh, particular communities, uh, competing for resources and attention of our rulers and so forth. So, so we, want, we want true freedom. And as long as the Jews aren't willing to, to join us in that project, forget about it. So he's, he believes that um, the Jews were too religious? Yes. Like, there you go. There you go. Right. Okay. It's like you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't have to go far in history at all to find these questions directly re relevant today. Like, in what way, if any, is it detrimental um, or necessary to allow a hijab being worn in a public building? in the public setting, for instance. Is that something that people should be allowed to do? How does the anti-masking ordinance that the university put out pertaining to public assemblies um, affect the religious practices um, of Jews? Is it legitimate to deny a person, a couple, a wedding cake because you don't like their sexual orientation? Is that a question of, of religious freedom? Um, is it legitimate for ultra-religious um, Jews in Israel to clamor for um, open warfare while at the same time also refusing to serve in the army for religious reasons. All those kinds of questions um, have been brought up and have been debated recently. And it shows that there are, of course, uh, questions of religious freedom and the rights and obligations of people toward the state um, that are legitimate to ask, but you either can say, you know, everybody according to their religious practices, um, or everybody according to their duties to the state. And then the question is who makes those, who, who determines what those duties are? It is not exactly like an easy thing to answer, but for the liberals in Bruno Bauer's vein, it's clear. The state does not recognize religion. A state that recognizes religion is not a real state. It is lacking because it reflects um, a divided society where people are allowed to, to sit in their corner and separate themselves from the life of humanity at large, which is represented in the quality of citizens. So if you're sitting there saying, I won't vote because I'm Jehovah's Witness, you know, that's problematic. You're not really part of it. Um, and Marx takes issue with that. Can you think of other examples of this? This tension between like particular religious practices and um, universal rights. Think of uh, the Mormons and like polygamy. And you know, how, you know, there's a bit of a tension there where like the rest of the society doesn't believe in polygamy. It, I think it's actually illegal, isn't it? In, in Utah, I, maybe in most places, if not in oh, Utah. Oh, yeah. no. I think polygamy is maybe legal in Utah. I'm not sure. 
it's definitely tolerated um, and not persecuted for religious reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's another good example. So what is um what is Marx saying to Bauer by way of criticism? Um he is asking what exactly if the point of the state of liberal constitutional state modeled after France and the United States that Bauer and others like him want, what exactly is there about human emancipation, about people being free and equal. So that is when Marx starts to look at the constitutions of individual states in the United States. What are these rights, these equal rights that people have when they live in those? The freedom of religion, the freedom of property. Those are at the very top of the list. Of course, freedom of speech. You have the the different opinions that follow according to the um, fruit materialism of James Madison from the different kinds and amounts of property that people own. That's the reason why we have different opinions. So all of these things that are being guaranteed as rights are in fact about the ability and the, the right of people to set themselves apart from others, to divide themselves into different classes, faiths, and opinions. So as it turns out, the state that, according to Bauer and other liberals, was supposed to create a real home for this utopia of humanity living communally as a group of equals, and we sure are equals when it comes to the right to vote or to our status as citizens and subjects to the laws. But nevertheless, what is the point of these laws? It is to allow us to carry on as particular self-interested individuals. This is like um, a reminder of something that Locke already would have told you, um, but it's emphasized for clarity that indeed, it's not just Locke saying, you know, the purpose of the state is to allow us to carry on with our self-interest, the better. Um, the practice of that of the states built on that philosophy show that that's exactly the point. Like the proof is in the pudding. In the United States, did religion disappear? No, but politically it was abolished as a factor in the state. The last vestiges of established religion were gone in the 1820s, and the U.S. Constitution at the federal level specifically outlaws the establishment of a state religion. And that has been broadened to mean, um, or it has been interpreted to entail a separation of church and state. Um, that certainly was the idea. They looked at England and they had a checklist. Are we gonna copy this bit or that bit? And the church of England was on the definitely don't copy side. The Bank of England was on the, yeah, let's do this list, not in the Constitution, but Hamilton right away after it. Um, but the political abolition, abstract abolition of religion for the citizen does not abolish religious man. It does not make the individual in civil society, the actual practical man, less religious or unreligious. Quite the contrary, the whole point of the state, of the liberal state, is to guarantee him the right to remain with it. So um, that's a loss right there for the theory. Property owners. The United States is a socialist country where everybody has the same amount of property, right? Oh, okay. My bad. Um, in spite of the fact that property was politically abolished, by 1830 as a factor in politics. Before, that, like, that's the last, the, well, other than South Carolina, but by 1830, no state had a property requirement for the right to vote. Um, so politically, property was abolished. It was a perfect communist uh, political system <laughs> where the um, 
you know, property has no relevance whatsoever. Turns out that the protection of private property, <laughs> which establishes class divisions, however, was exactly one of the main purposes of this. So, and so on and so on. So he's saying, Bauer and your liberals, you want a society where people are brought together on the basis of the common realization that each the, the freedom of each individual relies on the, depends on the freedom of each other, and that it's a cooperative enterprise and that we can live up to a potential as humans if only we realize this. And yet your political project entails cementing the main dividing lines that keep people at odds, um, religion, property, and then, you know, um, derive from that opinion. So that is not going to be, um, and, and yet you have the nerve to ask Jews to ditch their religion, even though where your plan was carried out, people have become, if anything, more religious, you know, in the U.S. Think about how this plays out for race. Um, at what point did race not matter as a question for voting rights? Yeah, like which was passed when? Actually, the voting rights was for the vote, and then the Civil Rights Act was for the um, segregation. So, yeah, 64. When was that abolished? When was the Voting Rights Act for all practical purposes abolished? It has since been um, further picked apart. Didn't know that it did get abolished. The yes. 1965 one? Yeah. The Supreme Court invalidated its most important provision in 2011 or 13. Yeah, I just got that. I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, what's he talking about? Like, yeah, it was very recent. Like, we're going to try to be removed. The, uh, pre, the pre clearance requirement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So that was, that's where jurisdictions. Specifically enumerated in that act as requiring free clearance for any changes to voting laws, sued saying it's been 50 years, we haven't been doing this stuff. This is discrimination. We're not more racist. And the Supreme Court was like, Yeah, you're right, it is discrimination. Um, you haven't been doing this for 50 years. The day after the Supreme Court made its decision, the um the drawers, the desk drawers popped open in these jurisdictions with the new, more restrictive um, voting uh, laws. And immediately, these very jurisdictions proceeded to severely limit um, the right to vote. All, of course, as usual, without any reference whatsoever to race, but in ways that resulted in the disfranchisement of a disproportionate number of black people, usually, or uh, Latino all, all in some places. So, um, but in terms of the ability of the federal government to intervene, um, that was gutted by this um, decision. And then it's further weakened the act since then, the Supreme Court has, not as severely. Then. So you could say that from 1964 to 2011, there was no race in this country. Politically, race was abolished. Um, in that it was no longer a determinant, determining factor uh, for who gets to have the right to vote. Um, you might point out that the voting rights legislation specifically demanded that race be made a factor in apportioning district boundaries, of course. Like, um, you have to make sure that a certain number of districts in your state has a realistic chance of having that representative specifically in the southern states with a history of specifically discriminating not just against any old minority but against black people. Um, so there's that. Nevertheless, you can still say the point of um, outlawing this discrimination is to make sure that race does not factor into the political makeup of the representation because um, of, naturally um, it doesn't prefigure the outcome to say we want the representative from this place to be black or we want a certain percentage 
of people from the state to be black so as to reflect the percentage of black people in the state, which says nothing at all about what political views they're going to. Um, or do you think that race is a direct factor in shaping somebody's political views because our point is to make it irrelevant as a political factor? So it's a little more complex than to say that we don't consider um, property rights or gender. You know, There have been no genders in this country since 1919. That was abolished with the 20th Amendment of 1920. Um, by that logic, you could say actually not so, not, not quite. Um, so civil society and the state exists in tangent. In the state, people are emancipated, equal, freed from all the stuff that divides them in real life, the stuff that makes them different. Um, and therefore, they're free. So that's, but in reality, that's not the case. Now, the question would be what's the practice that causes this, dif uh, this um, division? What is the actual social practice that is to blame for this division? Because if it was just like people coming to the realization that this is all unnatural, we don't have to divide ourselves into races, genders, classes, and so forth, that those are all isms uh, that we need to leave behind us. We should see each other as equals, uh, regardless of those things. You know, that would be the, the primitive materialist approach. Uh, like Feuerbach says, if we just forget about religion, then it won't bother us anymore. Um, or is there something that promotes the division among people, that society becomes fragmented, self-interested, and so forth? So um, this is where Marx starts thinking about capitalism and economics. Um, where does the division come from? Where is the incentive? To withdraw into your own little corner and pursue your self-interest. So, uh, and what does that have to do with Jews? Um, we'll talk about that on Friday. If between now and then you want to read on the Jewish question, it's in your reader that you have, the red one, the big red reader, Marx and Engels reader, you have that, right? Yeah. Tucker, yeah.